Good evening, friends. My name is Molly Marshall. I'm the interim president here at United Theological Seminary, and we are so delighted that you are here tonight. We have with us alums, friends, new friends, donors, students. I invite you as a way of being in, to, in community to drop your name and location into the chat so that we can have a sense of who has gathered here tonight. We are so pleased that you are here. Blessed Advent to each of you. Our faculty favorite lecture series is a time when we invite our faculty to do what they do best, to offer their gifts of teaching and to give us a glimpse of what happens in the classroom. Our hope is that you will have a chance to see the breadth and the wonder of the educational experience here at United. We are so grateful for each of you. And in this long period, when we could not gather in person, we are so grateful that we can gather in this way. It's now my privilege to call on Peregrine Morcall Williams, who is doing a dual MDiv and MA degree with program concentrations in both Unitarian Universalism and Biblical Studies. He and I were just talking about papers he is writing. Let that encourage the rest of you who are tuned in tonight. Peregrine, please introduce our distinguished professor. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. As Dr. Marshall said, my name is Peregrine Morkel Williams and I use he, him pronouns. I'm a second year MDiv MA student and a member of the Student Leadership Collective. I'm thrilled this evening to introduce Dr. Jennifer Oz Freeman, United's Program Director and Assistant Professor of Arts and Theology. Dr. AF is a vital and beloved part of the United community. I wanna share with you two of the most important things I've learned from Dr. AF. The first, is that theology is something we do with our whole beings. Our talking minds, yes, and all our senses, our hearts, and our bodies. This means that we need to take art seriously as a source of theological learning, both historical art and contemporary art, both witnessing art and creating it. The second important lesson I've learned from Dr. AF is harder to state directly because it's something she teaches through her presence and influence. She encourages all her students to experiment with new art forms, whether or not they've ever considered themselves to be artistic. And this encouragement is very wholesome and very healthy. It's without pressure and without tangledness. She has that rare ability to support both new artists who need general encouragement, as well as more experienced artists who need concrete advice and guidance. Dr. AF's consistent support of students' art has strengthened United's culture of appreciating artistic engagement in all its forms. We are a better school for her presence here. Will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Jennifer Oz Freeman. Thank you, Peregrine, for that lovely introduction. <laughs> Kind of uh, humbling. <laughs> that works great. Well, uh, in addition to thanking Peregrine, <laughs> um, I'd like to also uh, thank Cindy Beth Johnson for organizing this series and for inviting me to participate. Uh, I'm also grateful for President Molly Marshall and for my colleague Damian Wheeler for their previous presentations and the rich conversation uh, that's already been initiated in this series. And I hope to contribute just a little bit to that. At this time of year, <laughs> images of the Virgin Mary are found everywhere. Often when you're standing in the grocery line, um, when we'd be waiting and you see the covers of magazines or if you uh, go to the post office and buy stamps or whatever. She is everywhere at this time of year. 
And tonight I would like to complicate or nuance, maybe give some background to the many images you might encounter in this season to consider historical depictions of other moments in Mary's narrative as a mother. For the sake of time and reflecting my own research specialty, I'm going to limit my examples to early Christian, Byzantine, and medieval examples. My hope is to offer an introductory overview of some of the recurring themes, issues, and opportunities uh, in the study of history of images of Mary. We might start by considering how do we recognize Mary? How do we know it's her when we see an image of Mary? While blue is her signature color, that wasn't always the case. The earliest surviving images of Mary are found in the Christian catacombs of Rome, but she has many guises <laughs> uh, in, many, in several media and uh, globally as well as we'll see. But these earliest images of Mary, as I said, appear in the Christian catacombs of Rome for the very good reason that they were preserved through their funerary context. And it is indeed important to consider context when attempting to identify early Christian images, because of course, a nursing mother or a mother with child does not the Virgin make. As in the case of this group of images dating to about 260. The images of three youths in the fiery furnace from Daniel chapter three and the good shepherd on the ceiling, don't even get me started talking about him, as well as numerous other Christian images in nearby chambers help us to identify the catacomb of Priscilla as Christian. The figure in the lunette uh, kind of directly facing us here raises her arms in prayer, a pose known as the Orans or the Orant pose. But how should we read the seated woman to the right? While it may be Mary, mothers nursing and holding children were a quotidian sight in the ancient world as today. Likewise, this image depicts a woman with arms raised and a frontal facing child on her lap. She is flanked by the Cairo Christogram, that is the first two letters of the Greek word Christos. Is this the Virgin Mary or a portrait of a Christian woman who was entombed below? As I hope we'll see by the end of this talk, this iconography does come to be associated with Mary, but when we're interpreting, we need to think about uh, context and audience as well. Returning briefly to the catacomb of Priscilla, and I'll have several examples from this catacomb uh, throughout my talk, we find another potential image of Mary and the baby Jesus, and it is in terrible condition, so it's okay if you can't quite figure it out. <laughs> um, <laughs> the image that the figure that has been identified as Mary or kind of speculated to be Mary is that kind of uh, blob on the right hand side. And if you look long enough, you might see a child kind of turning over its shoulder to look at you. Some have read the figure on the left as Balaam pointing to a star, which is the uh, kind of sphere just over her right shoulder as a kind of illustration of his prophecy recorded in the book of Numbers. Of course, it's not just that mothers were ubiquitous in the ancient world, but the iconography of divine mothers and sons was as well. Precedent is found in images like these of the goddess Isis and her son Horus. This meant, as the Byzantine iconoclast position would argue centuries later, that unless an image of Mary was labeled, the viewer ran the risk of venerating someone else. But it is also meant that there was a, it also meant that there was a long established precedent for the divine mother-son pair which Christian iconography was able to invoke and capitalize on. There are more readily identifiable images of Mary in early Christian art, most commonly in depictions of the adoration of the Magi as seen here, which again, we will uh, return to. And you might note actually an image of the nativity uh, in the top right uh, of the lid of the sarcophagus. Iconography of the Virgin Mary was established during or by the fifth century, no doubt encouraged uh, or in response to the fourth ecumenical council held in Ephesus in modern day Turkey in 451 CE. The mosaics of Santa Maria Maggiore, and we have to ignore all this kind of yucky Baroque era kind of stuff there. And we're just gonna look at the mosaics around the triumphal arch. Uh, these mosaics and Santa Maria Maggiore was one of the first churches dedicated to the Virgin Mary, celebrating her status as the Theotokos or the God bearer, the one who gave birth to God by depicting scenes of the Annunciation. Here's a bit of a detail um, we see in the top register and then the adoration of the Magi directly below. 
in this triumphal arch directly above the altar. The title of Theotokos is a Christological one in that it affirms that Jesus was both fully God and fully human at birth. But before we get to Advent and Nativity, we should walk it back a little bit to the event that initiated it all, the Annunciation. According to the Gospel of Luke, Mary was visited by the angel Gabriel. The angel calls her favored uh, two times. I appreciate Mary here as a skeptical reader of Gabriel's text, as she was, quote, much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. And she asked the angel to explain how such a conception could occur, given that she was a virgin. Ultimately, Mary asks herself, or Mary offers herself, here am I, the servant of the Lord, words that recall, at least for me, those of Moses and Abraham, uh, as they accepted their, their respective calls from God. The genealogy in Matthew's gospel is a bit more succinct, quote, now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way, here it is for you, when his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to get into the weeds of uh, all the various theological debates and interpretations of the virgin birth, I'll just refer you to Dean Roberts' book, <laughs> and you can take it up uh, there. <laughs> The Feast of the Annunciation has been celebrated by the Christian church from at least the fourth century. And the earliest records show that it was ascribed to March 25th uh, and, this, and was further established at the Council of Toledo in, in 656, if you're interested. <laughs> uh, it may be of interest to note briefly the tradition around calculating the dates of the Annunciation, Nativity and Crucifixion. While early Christians uh, calculated the, the, originally early Christians calculated the date of Easter from the Jewish calendar, Anti-Jewish sentiments caused them to abandon this practice in the third century, instead calculating the date themselves. And you can see here a, um, a replica of one such computus table um, for calculating significant dates, in this case, Easter. So the Christian community selected March 25th as the date of the crucifixion, which had already been suggested by Tertullian in the third century because it was the date of the Roman vernal equinox. Likewise, Romans recognized the winter solstice on December 25th, although this wasn't the actual winter solstice, but uh, that as it occurred in antiquity, but was the traditional day according to the Julian calendar. Sol Invictus, the Roman sun god, was also celebrated on December 25th, though it seems not until the late third century uh, during the reign of Emperor Aurelian, and then we don't have a solid kind of textual tradition about that until 354. Um, so there's a kind of maybe um, in tandem, Christians and Romans are having these uh, festivals around these dates. At any rate, we can note that regardless of religious identity, late antique people valued associating their respective deities with the winter solstice as a way of signaling and expressing their cosmic significance, right? This is true of pagan communities and of early Christian communities. And conveniently for the Christians, December 25th is nine months after the Feast of the Annunciation on March 25th. So that math plays out very nicely. Um, the coinciding of Jesus's conception and death on the same day was consistent with the late antique idea of a perfect life in which a person was born and died on the same day in the calendar. This image is a little bit later, but I couldn't resist showing you this really spectacular uh, Paschal hand ca uh, calendar. So this is a way of calculating the calendar um, using your hands. And there's a great tradition in medieval uh, art and culture of mnemonic devices and so on in, um, in medieval manuscripts using angel's wings, the feathers of angel's wings as a way to memorize things and so on. So if you need to calculate your holiday, I guess you can <laughs> use this. So we could spend the rest of the time talking about these complex dating issues, but we need to move on to the task at hand. Sorry, Peregrine, that's for you. <laughs> if you are familiar with the iconography of the Annunciation, it is likely it is that which was established in later medieval and Renaissance images like this, or this. In these, Mary almost always appears in a church-like interior interrupted from her prayers by the angel Gabriel. His speech often appears on a scroll, the medieval equivalent of a speech bubble. 
Additional theological symbolisms as the, uh, are found in the presence of lilies, which often uh, are interpreted as signaling purity and or the Trinity, depending on how many flowers are depicted. Um, there's also embedded iconography in the decoration of a room, as we see here in the floor. You can probably barely see that, but in the tiles of the floor and the stained glass windows and frescoes in the background. The moment of conception is visualized in the presence of the dove of the Holy Spirit, or sometimes a little homunculus beaming in on golden uh, rays of light. We can return to the catacomb of Priscilla for the earliest images of the Annunciation, which as you can see, present only the very essential elements of the narrative. And again, in not very uh, good form now. We get a little bit more detail looking at the fifth century mosaics of Santa Maria Maggiore, which we just saw. Here, Mary appears dressed in gold in that top register, flanked by a kind of angelic guard. The angel Gabriel and the dove of the Holy Spirit hover overhead in a colorful cloudy sky. Before she took up reading at the Annunciation, the Virgin Mary was depicted spinning, uh, spinning thread and or weaving. This detail stems from the apocryphal Proto-Evangelium of James, which dates to the second or third century. It was a popular, it was popular in the East, but rejected by the West um, by Jerome because it had references to Joseph's first marriage and uh, children from that marriage. Still, the Proto-Evangelium uh, became part of the later compilation of infancy narratives that are known as the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew. That dates to about the sixth century. In the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew, the, the Annunciation begins with Mary drawing water at a well. This is a much later image. When she hears the voice of God, uh, and I see this you know, is no doubt referring to other important biblical accounts of encounters at wells, for example, that of Jesus and the Samaritan woman. As the Theotokos or God bearer, Mary draws from the fountain and distributes the living water to all. She is the vessel of salvation, the divine container. Her identity as such is not made manifest merely through abstract concepts and theologies, but through the physical act of motherhood. As the well and pitcher were filled with water, so is Mary filled with the Holy Spirit. And as a good vessel, she pours out God, giving birth to Jesus. The mouth of the well is an effective visual reminder of the opening of Mary's womb as she quite literally delivers salvation to the world. Now, after this little encounter at the well and understandably freaked out by hearing divine voices, Mary returns home and frantically begins spinning purple thread to weave a veil for the temple. Gabriel appears and the Annunciation narrative plays out. In this icon, Mary holds a skein of dark red thread in her left hand and clasps a loose end of the thread near her heart with her right hand. In fact, if you look closely, you will see a miniature of the baby Jesus inscribed on her chest perhaps inviting the viewer to think of the words of the psalmist who described God, God knitting them together in their mother's womb. The veil she weaves not only represents the child woven in her womb, but also the preparation and willingness of Mary's body to serve as the temple of God incarnate. It also somberly foreshadows the splitting of the temple curtain at the hour of Jesus's death. While the image of Mary weaving continues in the West throughout the Middle Ages, it is overtaken by images of Mary reading at the Annunciation. Go. It'll come. Maybe. Here we go. In the 11th and 12th century, uh, Mary begins reading, perhaps as a reflection of pseudo Matthew's description of her as, quote, learned in the wisdom of the law of God. In this relief, Mary raises her hand in acknowledgement of uh, Gabriel to her left there, or to our left, her right. In her left hand, she holds a closed book. This panel was originally part of a pulpit in a church in Florence, and thus this motif is an apt choice as the gospels and epistles would have been read from that pulpit, right? So a kind of proclamation of the gospel. Mary's study of scripture, singing of the Psalms, and very embodiment of wisdom made her an ideal mother for the divine and a model for monastics and laity alike. Images of her engaged in textual study present her purity as being not only in body, but also in her mind and intellect. Laura Setvit Miles, whose work I highly recommend on this topic, has traced the medieval development of Mary's book in these images. She's shown, uh, Laura has shown that in the 12th century, Mary's reading at the Annunciation was directed especially at enclosed religious women or nuns. Miles writes that, quote, the rhetoric shifts to encourage devotees to pray like Mary, not just to her, to use the Annunciation as a mirror in which to conceive oneself as reading or singing scripture in order to conceive God in the soul, end quote. 
This is perhaps nowhere more evident than in images of the Annunciation in medieval books of ours, which were personal devotional books made popular by medieval women. They're highly customizable. They're uh, meant to be held in the hands, so they're of a small scale. And they, in this sense, kind of serve, uh, and the, as the image that we see here on the right-hand side, serve as a mirror for the reader, as Mary is pictured here reading her own book of hours, right? So the book of hours contains an image of a book of hours and we kind of participate in that, can see ourselves in Mary. The Eastern tradition of the Annunciation emphasizes Mary's devotion to the temple through her weaving of the veil, which also by doubling as a metaphor for the life in her womb, alludes to her interior life, her pondering of the words of Gabriel. The Western tradition of Mary reading at the Annunciation presents her as a model for Christian devotion and more, speci more specifically for Christian literacy and study. That is, this motif is also an expression of the interior life of Mary. From here, I'd like to shift to considering the proleptic relationship between birth and death in nativity images. The symbolic language found in the icons of the Virgin Mary and Jesus suggests a distinct connection between Mary's womb and sexuality to Jesus's tomb and mortality. The most obvious being that the death and resurrection of Jesus cannot exist without the sexuality of Mary. In Western images, as in this altarpiece by Matthias Grunwald, Jesus's sacrificial death is referenced through elements such as his swaddling clothes, which in their tattered state seem to double as a burial shroud. Additionally, the coral of his rosary was a material believed to ward off the evil eye. In some medieval and Renaissance images, he is depicted sleeping in his mother's arms in a foreshadowing of the Pieta motif. Reflecting the account in the Proto-Evangelium of James, the nativity and Eastern Orthodox icons almost always occurs at the mouth of a caved turn stable. My image should be changing any second. It's appropriate for Advent to wait. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> well, there are some variables depending on the iconographer. The focus is always the center of the painting where Mary reclines, seemingly weightless on a red blanket. Just over her shoulder, the infant Jesus lies swaddled in a manger at the cave's looming entrance. An ox and an ass serenely look over him. And surrounding vignettes, midwives attend to the child. Joseph sits pondering, the magi bring gifts and three angels worship. The oval shape of Mary's blanket is noteworthy in its resemblance to a mandorla. The plush red folds and almond shape re reinforce Mary as a sexual being and a mother. In Mary, heaven and earth make the most important intersection in history. Through the vessel of her body comes the one who is fully God and fully man, the divine paradox. While her immediate surroundings speak of life, those of the Christ child speak of death. The Magi's gifts of frankincense and myrrh, funerary items, allude to the fragrances the three women will bring to Jesus's tomb. In the cradled casket, his swaddling clothes read like a death shroud. The darkness of the cave behind him is ominous, but not overpowering. We could read this opening as referring to the incarnation. The nativity in a cave echoes Jesus's birth by woman, created from the earth, an opening with an opening. It also ties his sacrificial death to his birth, a womb within a tomb or vice versa, Mary's womb as Jesus's tomb. Likewise, the cave is echoed in Byzantine icons of the crucifixion in which the skull of Adam is often depicted in a cave-like opening, the symbiotic relationship between life and death, between the sacrificial death of Jesus who tramples down death by death with the life bestowed upon all. Now I've already, I've just mentioned the Magi in passing and we really can't talk about nativity and Advent uh, without at least a brief discussion of the three Magi who appear in uh, Christmas plays and crushes and so on. This icon iconographic motif based on Matthew chapter two serves as confirmation of baby Jesus's divine, and, uh, divine nature and spiritual kingship. So we'll return one more time to the catacomb of Priscilla where once again, we see a pared down rendering of the story three figures approaching a seated person, and in fact, persons, because Jesus is there on Mary's lap. We can get a little bit uh, better image uh, returning to the uh, sarcophagus of Adelphia from the fourth century, where these figures are uh, more articulated in stone. They're wearing their Phrygian caps, the Smurf caps, to signal that they're from the East. 
In the so-called dogmatic sarcophagus, which has been dated to just around or after the Council of Nicaea, the three magi serve to reinforce the Trinitarian image in the upper register. So you can see um, God the Father seated here, uh, the Son who has just created Adam and Eve, and then the Holy Spirit, aka the third wheel, kind of peeking over the, over the throne here. Um, and so there's a pretty clear visual echo or um, pairing between God the Father enthroned and the Virgin Mary seated in this wicker chair with the infant Jesus on her lap. His head has been repaired at a smaller uh, scale there. And then again, our three magi with their Phrygian caps, bringing their gifts and Joseph, just like the Holy Spirit is the third wheel. <laughs> Poor guy. And, uh, but interestingly, uh, the first magi here points not to one star, but three uh, stars. And so I won't get into the whole uh, Council of Nicaea. You'll have to take historical theology for that. And we'll, but you know, <laughs> there's an affirmation of the co equality, co eternality of the Father and the Son. And that's reflected in the iconography of this sarcophagus. The Magi also served as models for royalty and for the laity, the average Christian, uh, to encourage them to bring, or as a visualization for bringing their offerings to the church, as in this detail, in the hem of uh, the Empress Theodora's garment in San Vitale in Ravenna. In the West in particular, the adoration of the Magi became an opportunity for medieval artists to have fun with elaborate costuming. The foreignness of the Magi was also signaled. Well, here, we're gonna to have to wait again. It makes it more dramatic, I think. I mean, I know what the next slide is, but it will be exciting for you. Here we go. Uh, so the foreignness of the Magi was also signaled by the inclusion of an African Magi, and this trend began in the later Middle Ages. Note that this figure is consistently depicted the furthest away from Mary and Jesus, which has been interpreted as reflecting the European perspective that Africa was the younger and more distant in terms of its Christianity. This is really ironic and totally incorrect, given that Christianity was in Africa from at least the second century, if not earlier. It is not possible to unpack all of the theology and tradition and baggage around the iconography of the Virgin Mary in a single evening. And I'm, I don't think I'm not dumb enough to try that, but I would like to consider one more important aspect of Mary's iconography before we conclude that of her role as an antitype to, Mar uh, to Eve. Early Christian and medieval texts consistently paired and juxtaposed the first mother Eve with Mary. As Eve is the mother of all the living, so is Mary the mother of all Christians. Eve came to represent the Hebrew Bible and its quote unquote, you know, old covenant of sin and death, and Mary came to represent the New Testament and the new covenant of redemption. As Jesus was the second Adam, so was Mary the second Eve. And as Justin Martyr wrote in the second century, quote, for Eve, an undefiled virgin, conceived the word of the serpent and brought forth disobedience and death. But the Virgin Mary, filled with faith and joy when the angel Gabriel announced to her that good tidings of the spirit of the Lord would come upon her, and therefore the Holy One born of her would be of the Son of God. About a century later, Jerome employed a similar juxtaposition when he wrote, quote, now that a virgin has conceived in the womb and born to us a child, now the chain of the curse is broken. Death came through Eve, but life has come through Mary. Eve is synonymous with condemnation in this sense, while Mary embodies redemption. An eighth or ninth century antiphon for the Feast of the Annunciation plays on the anagram of Gabriel's greeting to Mary as evidence of that reversal in the Latin, not in the English. It goes, uh, receiving that Ave from the mouth of Gabriel, establish us in peace, changing the name of Eve. Ave being Gabriel's greeting to her. Eve and Mary were also compared and contrasted in terms of their physical roles as mothers, that is of their particular children. Medieval physiological theory, which had its roots in antiquity, taught that a mother's womb blood was converted into milk in the breast. Relatedly, it was common belief that the milk of a mother or wet nurse communicated something of her nature or character to her infant. As the two most important women in the Christian narrative, Eve and Mary, along with their sons, were prime examples of the effects of good and bad milk. 
There's no mention of Eve nursing in Genesis or in the first century life of Adam and Eve, uh, that text, but some authors asserted that just as the goodness of Mary's body is evidence in the salvific life of her son, Jesus, so the bad blood of Eve becomes apparent in the demonic act of her son, Cain. Mary's milk, on the other hand, became biologically and spiritually linked to Christ's blood when it nourished the savior in her womb. His embodied sacrifice was inextricably tied up with hers. For example, a 13th century folio contains the hymn De Sancta Cruce et de Beata Maria Virginis, which compares Mary and the tree of life. Quote, the cross in the place of pasture feeds us particularly, but the virgin particularly feeds that which feeds. Mary feeds that which feeds. In other words, in celebrating Mary's role as the mother who fed the infant Christ so, so that he might nourish the world, the author of the hymn implicitly links her milk with his blood. This connection is reinforced on the composition of the page in which a miniature of the crucifixion within an architectural frame occupies about a third of the page on the right. Mary is depicted in three of the smaller frames to the left, reclining and nursing Christ as the newborn, holding and then nursing him as an older infant and toddler or toddler. This physiological theory is consistent with early literary traditions that read Eve's deception by the serpent in sexual terms. For example, the Proto-Evangelium of James, again, records Joseph's indignant reaction to the news of Mary's pregnancy, which he likened to Eve's temptation. Quote, who has deceived me? Who has done this evil in my house and defiled her? Has the story of Adam been repeated in me? For as Adam was absent in the hour of his prayer and the serpent came and found Eve alone and deceived her and defiled her, so also has it happened to me. The ambiguity of the term to deceive in Greek and in Latin allowed for readers to infer a sexual seduction in this scene. Thus, for some early interpreters, Cain was the demonic offspring of Eve and the serpent. However, she was conceived not in the usual way, but through Eve's ear, because it was by obedience to the serpent's speech that she sinned. This, of course, contrasts with Mary's obedience to Gabriel's word and recall that inversion of Eva and Ave. As devotion to the Virgin Mary increased in the 12th and especially 13th centuries, the visual juxtaposition with Eve became more explicit. As Mary, as Mary Rubin has pointed out, the habit of depicting Mary within a garden, you can think of the um, enclosed garden in Song of Songs 412, invited a natural juxtaposition between her and Eve. In one such example, that of the Virgin and Child enthroned with angels, uh, Eve reclines draped only in a thin veil as Mary nurses Christ with a seraphim framed throne above. The intimations of either woman's garden are reduced to a vase of roses at the Virgin Mother's feet and a broken off branch still bearing its fruit clutched in Eve's hand. Similarly, the Madonna of Humility is a bit more dynamic in composition as Mary appears seated on a cushion. Still framed by a dramatically embossed gold field, she casually drapes her hands around her child who manages to look over his shoulder at the viewer while he nurses. It's multitasking. The artist has created a predella-like space at the bottom of the panel by virtue of the horizontal line of Mary's cushion. Eve reclines in profile, nude with a bit of cloth across her waist and her hair undone. She grasps a small piece of fruit in her hand as a, as a post encircled with a human-headed serpent seems to rise from between her legs. Beth Williamson has argued that we shouldn't reduce these juxtapositions between Eve and Mary to be inherently or necessarily critical of Eve, but also as a positive expression of Eve's role as the initiator of salvation history. And we have some um, early texts that do kind of praise Eve in that way. Hymnography, iconography, and theological treatises celebrated Mary's paradoxical role as the Theotokos, the God bearer the container of that which was uncontainable by invoking biblical language and images such as the burning bush and the Ark of the Covenant. One of my favorite examples of this is found in the alphabetically organized collection of hymns known as the Harp of Glory. It seems that Marian devotion saw a noted increase in Ethiopia in the 15th century as reflected in hymns and images uh, such as this illuminated gospel book. As I've already mentioned, according to tradition, Christianity is in Ethiopia uh, in the first century, and that's because of the Ethiopian eunuch who converted to Christianity, and according to tradition, returned to Ethiopia. Um, we have other, you know, we have further textual evidence that um, Christianity was in Ethiopia in the third and fourth centuries. The author of this work, who may have been a monk, lauds the Virgin Mary in layers of biblical references. The author addresses Mary 
My lady, Ark of the Covenant, clad in gold inside and out, whose pillars the cherubim covered on all sides, you were the golden table bordered with golden edges on which were placed the vessels for sacrifice. You are the candle stand with six branches, three on either side, casting light before and behind it. In other words, she's, she's conceived of in liturgical, another pun conceived of, in liturgical uh, furnishings, right? She's the temple. Oh, there's the text for you. Um, and she is likened even more explicitly to the temple later on. The author praises Mary, quote, blessed virgin elected one, we name you a paradise in which the fruit, the perfumed tree is planted. We name you the fountain from which gushes forth the water of life. We name you the land which bore the apple fruit. We name you the bush. We name the bush which was enwrapped in fire. We name you the rod which budded forth a shoot. We name you the pole which bore the cluster of grapes. We name you the fleece which was covered in dew. We name you the tent of dwelling covered in glory. We name you the ark covered with the mercy seat. We name you the cloud which rained down food. We name you the dove whose sides were covered with red hued gold. We name you the turtle dove whose wings stretch over her chickens. We name you the ship laden with ridges, riches. We name you the harbor that calms the heaving sea. We name you the land that gives a rich crop. We name you a heaven. The author goes on to describe Mary as an altar, as liturgical vestments, as a queen, as light, as the temple of heaven, and on and on. Of her role in redemption, the hymn declares, quote, by the blood of the grape you bore, all of the curse of Eve was lifted. This line invokes Jesus' description of himself as the vine and his disciples, the branches, and in, in a sense, inverts that very sense, uh, that very line, as it presents Mary as the vine who produces the grape that is Jesus. Right? So also a, a kind of obvious image to the Eucharistic um, wine. In this roughly contemporary uh, manuscript, we see the angel Gabriel approach from the right. Mary is seated in an architectural space with arms raised in the Oran's position. And I wonder if, and maybe you can barely see on the screen there, these two objects in either hand are meant to be drop spindles. Um, and so this is depicting her weaving at the Annunciation or spinning thread at the Annunciation in this kind of interior, um, beautifully decorated space. If I can move towards conclusion on a, a personal note, like many Orthodox churches, my own church in St. Paul bears an image of the Virgin Mary in its apse. I remember standing in church when I was pregnant with my third child. Uh, I was great with child, as one friend liked to say and laughing to myself at the inscription that flanks Mary in the space, wider than the heavens. Not something I'd recommend saying to a pregnant person. But theologically, Mary was wider than the heavens in that her body, uh, in her body, she contained the uncontainable, circumscribed the uncircumscribable. And so when we look up at the painted starry ceiling in this church, we might consider that as we stand in the church, we are embraced by the womb of Mary. Thank you. Dr. Alls Freeman, that was really wonderful and so timely. I think yesterday was the feast of the Immaculate Conception. And so to have that uh, this night, we're going to have a few minutes for questions and answers. And if you have any, please put your question in the chat. Uh, Dr. Cindy Beth Johnson will be monitoring that. But in the meantime, let's give Dr. Alls Freeman a wave. Uh, thank you for this wonderful, deeply learned lecture. Well, while you're thinking about questions, uh, I have one. Uh, so I was very interested in what you were saying about the depiction of uh, ethnic identity within these, particularly in the uh, depictions of the Magi. And I do remember in the, uh, the Chapel King's College, uh, Reuben's adoration of the Magi, in which he has all the known 
uh, so-called races of the world depicted as the Magi who've come to visit. Uh, I think it was a way of trying to draw all the world toward the focality of the Christ. But there's more going on in this. Would you come and, and say just a word about that? And then Cindy Beth will help us with more questions. Sure, thank you for that. And I wish I had that image. Um, yeah, I think that that's a good example of how, as I was saying in my opening comments, how important context is. And I think that um, figures are specifically in religious context can be used. <laughs> I you know, sometimes describe it as like the multivalence of images, right? Where they can, um, you can have uh, the exact same image have different receptions or different implications based on period and context and community that's viewing it. Um, so it could be, I mean, I think probably based on that time period, I would, I would still read that in maybe a, a implicitly negative way, right? If it has a kind of like Christian triumphalism to it in some way of like, we're bringing all nations, which isn't necessarily, uh, isn't necessarily a bad thing, but can be kind of, you know, weaponized or used in like colonial kind of like, or colonizing kind of efforts. Um, well, you see, I can speak more to the medieval examples um, where I think there's both a fascination uh, with Africa in this time. And part of that is because there was some successful uh, military leaders. And so you also see, for example, the first um, image of St. Maurice, who is an African military saint um, from the Roman period. Uh, in this time, I think 13th or 14th century, you see the first depiction of St. Maurice in which he actually looks like he's African. Before that, he had been depicted as a white European. Um, and so there's been some writing, like Geraldine Hang is somebody who's write, written about that. Um, and so I think it's interesting out in the ways that these um, iconographic choices reflect very much the period that they're produced in and what the kind of objectives are, right? So there's both a like maybe a fascination with, but then also still kind of employing it, you know, the identities of others as a tool in some of these images. If that makes sense. Yeah, thanks for the question. Jennifer, I have a question. I'd like to know how um, these visual proclamations have influenced your experience of these stories in your own life. Mm, that's a good question. Well, um, you know, I think that I've, trying to think of all my children, you know, all of my children, I was pregnant during Advent <laughs> for them. Um, and so there is something um, very, uh, well, just embodied and personal about that to be standing in a church as a pregnant person during Advent, you know, praying these hymns and seeing these images and kind of like, you know, um, thinking what that would be like, I suppose. <laughs> um, I'm thinking especially of the, nati the nativity images. Mm -hmm. um, so I do find them maybe, uh, I was gonna say personally encouraging, but that's maybe not, that's not really what I mean, but I don't know, kind of personal resonance. That's a very good question. I don't feel like I have a good answer. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> I, I feel like we all have just like a whole panorama of different ways to enter the yeah. story because yeah. you've given us such a, a breadth of, of images. I wasn't too many images. You can never have too many images. Well, right? that's, see, that's, that's, that's how right. I get into this situation is I think I can never have too many images. No, no, no. <laughs> We're of the same mind. That's right. <laughs> Any other questions? Feel free to drop them in the chat and um, give Jennifer a chance to go into this a little bit more. It's possible that she's answered all of our questions. Mm -hmm. I can call on people too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I know it takes a little bit of time also. Yeah, Melissa. Oh, sorry. Or 
Sorry, Melissa, I didn't see if you were raising your hand or maybe you were just fixing your scarf. Melissa's talking about the notion of the serpent's word entering through Eve's ear, reminding her that Justin Martyr says that at the conception, the Logos word of God, Jesus entered Mary through her ear. Do you yeah. want to say something more about that? Yeah, no, just that, that I should have included that as well. <laughs> um, and Melissa, you and I should probably talk about this paper that I'm trying to write on uh, early images of Eve nursing. So I kind of, I have a paper where I'm trying to develop that more and track how, because um, it's a kind of popular motif in, in late antiquity and then falls away for a while and then uh, kind of pops up again later. But um, it's interesting how it kind of ebbs and flows in relationship to images of, or devotion to Mary as well. So it feels like there's this like, um, gravitational pull or something between the two of them. And I might just mention that Melissa is an adjunct professor who teaches New Testament here. So people can, can take classes from Jennifer and Melissa. So Carly is asking, if you had to choose a depiction of Mary that speaks to our world right now, prophetically, in a prophetic way, what would it be? Oh, oofda. That's a good question, Carly. Um, well, uh, I don't think that it would be any of the images that I've shown you tonight. <laughs> I mean, that's not necessarily true. I'm sure maybe you could uh, you could find uh, you could find something in that. But I think that um, there's so many amazing images that have been made in the last, particularly in the last couple of years, um, in response to, uh, for example, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and also to response to the border crisis. And so um, actually our own Kimmy Graf recently mm -hmm. um, had a post about that, mm -hmm. right? Have you circulated that? In I haven't yet, I need okay. to. Okay, well, keep your eyes out for, for that forthcoming. We're sharing um, uh, a recent blog post by one of our alums, Kimmy Graf. Mm -hmm. um, So, I see your comment too, Mimi, that's great. Yeah. I'm not giving you a specific one there because there's kind of a whole litany in my mind of uh, examples, I suppose, that I'm thinking of, like Our Lady of Ferguson, for example. So Mimi's mentioning that looking at images of Mary is an Advent tradition. Um, I think that many of us appreciate that as a way of entering into the season. Yeah. Peregrine, did you say you had a question? Yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I really appreciate the, the images where Mary is reading for the, at the Annunciation and like thinking about her as, um, as a student or maybe as a scholar, probably due to her age, I would guess more on the student track. Um, I don't know, I'm taking four gospels this term. And one of the things that we're talking about is like the Jewishness mm -hmm. of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. So this isn't really a question, just a comment of, you know, how like how Mary studying, studying one, of course, you know, there was no New Testament for Mary. Right. Um, so she would have been studying the Tanakh. Right. Um, I, yeah, I wasn't familiar with those images, but I love them. So thanks. Yeah, and there are, um, so I mentioned Laura Sedford Miles's book. Um, she also has a, a, an earlier article version that came out in the medieval journal Speculum that kind of gives like the overview of what becomes that book project. And so you could see some of those sources in that book, or I mean, in that article. Um, and so I, it's a really very helpful overview, I think, for the development of that motif. Um, but in early textual sources, Mary is described as, you know, singing the Psalms. Um, so very much in, you know, like in a Jewish liturgical context that she's praised by early Christian theologians and interpreters as um, that she was very, you know, that, that she was a scholar kind of, or that she could interpret these things because of course she contains the word of God. And so she has this kind of, there's something, fit, it seems to be fitting about that in their mind. And then in the later Middle Ages, again, in uh, Laura Miles's book, um, she tracks how in the 12th century um, and on, 
the emphasis on Mary's textual knowledge or textual study becomes uh, a model for monastics and especially for um, male monastics. So it's something that it's, she's a model for both men and women, but in their description of Mary or interpretation of Mary, male monastics are grabbing more onto her scholarly study than on say, you know, her as, as mother, right? Um, which is interesting because you see other, um, plenty of other medieval examples in which uh, male monastics are identifying with female characters in the Bible, like especially the Song of Songs in which they read themselves as the bride. Um, so I don't know why in this instance it went that way, but. Jennifer, are there any particular cultures that directly link Mary with the earth as in, great, in a great mother kind of way? In a great mother kind of way. Hmm. Um, is that a future lecture? That could be a future lecture. I would, the place that I would go to look for that answer would probably be, well, Mary Rubin's book is one place I would look um, on, on Mary, uh, although she's um, a medievalist. And then there's also Judith Dupre has a nice book on um, Mary that kind of is a big overview of her. That, those would be two places that I would like. I don't know of that, but um, because she's, you know, conceived of as the mother of all conceived of, see another pun. Sorry, Peregrine, you bring out puns in me. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what about Mary as an image of priesthood? Chris Moroni saying, um, Mary is the first, Mary is mm -hmm. the first to say, this is my body. This is my blood. Mary's the first to say, this is my body. This That's is my body. what I'm reading. What about Mary as an image of priesthood? She is the first to say, this is my body. This is my blood. Chris, we might need more clarification. Yeah, I think I would that. need more context on that. Yeah. Um, and I can see Wilson's waving his hand. Yeah. Hi, Chris. It's good to see you. Lynn is asking in the images, is there a connection of the goddesses in pre-Christianity and Mary in the Christian religion? Would Mary have been seen as a goddess as defined by the older goddess traditions? And would the images portray this in any way? Mm. Pre-Christian, well, you know, so there are the images that I showed uh, of Isis and Horus, for example. Um, and and there are, I think you could kind of speak to um, contextual vocabulary trends. So for example, like maybe a, I'm gonna walk myself to this, but a parallel uh, phenomenon would be that of say, depictions of Jesus as Orpheus, right? In um, early Christian art. Um, and that's a way of making a kind of one building on or invoking um, Orpheus as a person who went to Hades and came back as a person who tames wild animals with his music. And early Christian theologians say, just as Orpheus uh, tames um, animals with his music, so does Jesus tame the, the human soul and that kind of thing. So it's not actually saying, you know, Jesus is Orpheus but it's using the existing iconography and symbolism to make a statement about Jesus and as part of a bigger campaign of early Christianity to assert itself as a religion. Um, I don't think you see that with Mary in the same way, especially in early Christian examples, um, because she becomes you know, more popular later. One thing that comes to mind is in the Middle Ages, you have the establishing of shrines to Mary near bodies of water that were associated with um, pagan female deities, right? So it's like this kind of, um, again, capitalizing on sites that are already associated with the feminine divine. And so of course that's a place where you would put a shrine to Mary. Is it also supersessionist? Uh, yeah, but it's something that's also, it's just resonating in the space too. And so images function like that, uh, a lot, I think, where they're, um, so I wouldn't say that she'd be thought of as a goddess, um, but as somebody who gave birth to God, 
um, she certainly has that kind of, you know, connotation. She certainly recapitulates the story of Eve, doesn't she? Dr. Ross Freeman, this is just wonderful, and we are grateful for what you know and what you have showed us tonight. Thank you all for being with us. Uh, our next lecture will be on Tuesday, January the 25th, when Reverend Dr. Gary Green will talk about playing the game, problems and possibilities for Black men in the United States. You will receive registration information about this in the near future. And we will continue the favorite faculty lecture series well into the spring as others of our colleagues will be sharing with you. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, and if you're intrigued by what you have heard, I encourage you to check out our website for more information for future opportunities, and you will see that United's commitment to education is paired with equally strong commitment to inclusivity, justice, spirituality, and the arts, as we have seen so very well. May every joy of the season be yours. Good night.